The following is a talk from The Moot With No Name, held at the Bell Pub in London. Steve Wilson discusses what he has learnt from the 777 plus talks he has attended. I did a calculation um, on the basis of uh, the fact that I started chairing Talking Sticks from its 10th meeting in 1990 um, through to about 2001 and, and then the first few uh, secret chiefs added to all of the uh, move of no names including the period when we went weekly plus South East London Folklore Society plus Philosophor which is an organisation which met weekly in London for many many years plus the conferences that I've been in I, I reckon I've got somewhere to about 777 talks admittedly I might have given 77 of them myself but uh, I wanted to get across what it is that I've learned and I've had a few revelations in my life. Most of them have been instant, but the one that really occurs to me as being important was something that has been very, very slow. Instant ones are very important in certain traditions, as all be seen, but slow ones are rather more interesting. Um, and at least one person here was probably at the slow one. Back in the 90s, at, I believe, the Black Horse, or it might have been Princess Louise, we had a talk from an Australian, not uh, dealing with original research, but research going back to the 1960s and 70s, which I found very, very interesting because it had to do with the Victorian English. They called themselves British. The name of the empire was British, but it was very, very English attitude towards history. And it has affected so many of the talks that I've heard, positively or negatively. And it goes something like this. The reason that Britain, plus the United States of America, rule the world, we are talking about over 100 years ago now, is because God wanted it that way. God did this by first of all getting the Jews to learn that there was only one God, which they passed to the Roman Empire, and by getting the Greeks to invent civilization, which they passed to the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire then took the combination of the two, eventually, um, to Britain. But unfortunately, the Romans being a little bit uh, a uh, kind of Mediterranean and B Roman Catholic, kind of lost their foothold in this country when the glorious Anglo-Saxons arrived, put down the terrible, terribly primitive Celtic people, and after a few hundred years, eventually we got to the point where we got our own church, the Church of England, where the first king and queen, now of course Emperor Empress of, uh, of India, um, spread this magnificent empire across the world, um, bringing enlightenment, bringing knowledge, bringing sophistication and culture, or as Alistair Crowley once put it, providing Bibles and trousers to benighted Hindus. <laughs> um, and of course he was taking the piss. The, the talk was about Aboriginal mythology. It wasn't actually, it was about Australian Aboriginal traditions in general. But the bit that really got me, and the bit that's grown ever since, was the fact that in the mid-19th century, all over Europe, including Britain, there was this vogue for pre-Christian mythology. And if you wanted to make money um, producing a book about your own nations or your own people's mythology was a rallying cry. It was slightly different for us because we were an island. But in countries where there was a lot of toing and throwing, or there had been, 
a, a call back to an ancient mythology was very powerful. It was an independence movement. For example, Finland had the uh, Kalevala. Or, for that matter, as a unification, Germany and Italy, for example, places that were made up of uh, different groups uniting together. In Britain, it was slightly different. But we did get very, very interested, nevertheless, <coughs> in Greek mythology and Roman mythology. The Roman mythology, of course, being Greek mythology with the, the names changed. That wasn't something that was done by the Victorians, it was something that was done by the Romans when they all wanted to be Greeks. And there was no Anglo Saxon mythology, because there isn't any that we've got written down, but there was Norse mythology. And gradually, the myths and legends of nations all over the world became a major publishing sensation to the point where you can still get books um, published newly by people like Wordsworth Press, I think it is, um, which actually come from the 19th century with these various myths in. And so as the British spread throughout the world, the publishers were eager to hear of the, of the mythology of various people, the, whether it was the Japanese or it was the Maoris or whatever, and they were eagerly awaiting Australian Aboriginal mythology. And when they got it back, they were really disappointed. What they found, what the explorers, I won't call them anthropologists because they weren't, even if they called themselves that, what these explorers found was two things. First of all, the mythology that Aboriginal men had was very basic, simple, and childish. And Aboriginal women didn't have any religion whatsoever. So the publishers were disappointed. This didn't really matter until the beginning of the Cold War, when it was realised that there was extraordinary um, amounts of uranium in Australia. And because there was a certain amount of protection to Aboriginal sacred lands that was afforded, the Australians, the Australian Aboriginals started complaining, hang on, that is our sacred land. That's sacred to our women. What do you mean sacred? Your women don't have a religion, we know. And a couple, and I do not know their names, and I suspect one person here remembers the talk, decide, a male and female, white Australian couple, went to the Aboriginal people and decided to find out what was going on by living their lifestyle. What they discovered was very, very simple and straightforward. Although the British had the idea that the native people of everywhere, including Australia, but everywhere, would like nothing more than to give the white man all of their stories. They didn't have that attitude. Their attitude was, who the fuck are you? Oh, right. Okay, you're male. The women will not talk to you about their religion because it's not your business. You're also not initiated. And in most of Aboriginal societies, you get initiated at the age of seven. When you're seven, you get taught that there's a deeper level to the stories you were taught as children. When you're 14, you get initiated again, or to use the language of Freemasonry, raised to a higher degree. And you get taught more mythology and more depth. When you get to the age of 21, 28, it carries on. So what the Aboriginals said, tribe after tribe after tribe, was what they told the under seven-year-olds. Now it backfired on the Aboriginals at first, but it became realised that in fact, everything that had been reported for it was about a hundred years old about Aboriginal religion was wrong. Well, it was true, but it was, it was only suitable for children. I found that talk absolutely fascinating. I found a lot of the rest of it fascinating as well. But that particular little bit bubbled under. Going back to the British and the imperial view of history, 
When I was at college studying philosophy, I was at one of the colleges, very few at the time, that taught the history of philosophy. Believe it or not, most British universities do not teach the history of philosophy. They teach current philosophy. They teach the basic idea of it. They don't teach its history. But it did become clear to me, more and more, especially in light of that talk, that we think, probably because of what we were taught as we grew up, that the ancient Greeks were British. We don't hear them speaking Greek. We see them played by actors. Anybody who remembers the original version of Clash of the Titans, Laurence Olivier played Zeus. Uh, I can't remember, I think, I mean, Baggy Smith or somebody else like that played Hera. They were noble, the gods of ancient Greece. They walked around in togas because they knew, having the power of prophecy, that the Romans would eventually take over their religion and therefore they wore togas, something which were unknown in Greece because, of course, the Greeks wore tunics. And, of course, the ancient philosophers wandered around having philosophical discourses with each other. Now, I also knew, however, that while the total amount of original Roman material that we have will fill one shelf of a library, standard library. The amount of original Greek material that we have wouldn't fill a quarter of that. We have some plays, we have a few discourses, but most of what we have from ancient Greece has actually been retranslated into Greek from Arabic. Christians destroyed so much. It was only stuff that was in the East. But I became very aware that when I was a child and I saw a map of the ancient world, the ancient world meant around the Mediterranean in such a way that you would never believe, for example, that one of the most important cult initiatory sites, Samothrace, was nearer to Bulgaria than it was to Athens because everything was contained within this <coughs> idea of this is where civilization came from. I'm probably going to divert on this a little bit. But the more I read about the Greek philosophers whose works, if they bothered to write any, um, uh, haven't come down to us, the more I became convinced that instead of thinking about Greek society, which was, let's not forget, as it was pointed out by one speaker, it was an island society. It was a culture that went from island to island to island and, had, and absorbed influences from the mainland. Athens was the exception, not the rule. It was a mainland port, city, the port itself being Piraeus, where they actually absorbed all the stuff coming in from the islands. The southern half of Greece was run by nutters, the Spartans. We know two things about the Spartans. Well, we have two records of the Spartans. One, I think, was Plato, who said that they were the most wonderful moral people in the world. And one by another guy, who said that they were the most dissolute bunch of arseholes you can possibly imagine. But there was a difference. One of them had actually visited Sparta. Plato hadn't. <laughs> As I began reading more and more about some of these weird philosophers that came from Greece, the more convinced I became, we're not talking about something like Rome, which was like 18th or 19th century Britain. We're talking about India. Weird guys with weird ideas wandering around, initiating people and giving them, giving them strange ideas. The Athenians didn't like strange ideas of that much. They killed Socrates. One of the reasons they killed, well, they, they forced him to commit suicide was because he was a peculiar fellow. He was a weirdo. He was executed for being a weirdo, basically. And 
corrupting the youth, i.e., telling them the things that they didn't, that the, that the government didn't want them to know. I followed a guy like that, and he wasn't Greek and he wasn't British. He was called Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh, and the authorities didn't like him either. Funnily enough, and they persecuted him fairly much. They had all sorts of strange ideas. They had schools. Schools of philosophy. Of course, Indians don't have schools because they've got darker skin than us. Right? They have gurus, they have sex, they have cults. The philosophers of Greece had schools, they had lyceums. They it were absolutely wonderful. But the idea of the different groups were just as disparate as anything that you're finding in, 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 in India. But not long ago, I was looking into the Greek mystery cults. Now, if you look at the British imperial view of history, the mystery cults were a bit annoying. They are some weird thing that people used to do when they weren't being noble Greeks. They went off and were pagan. Ronald Hutton gave a talk where he made a very, very important point. He was only talking about the Eleusinian mysteries. The writer of Eleusis, uh, not the ones that Crowley did, were carried out over a five-year cycle where the greater rites were held once every five years and every year you had the lesser rites. It's reckoned that they probably went on for about 2,000 years. Every year, people, providing they were more or less sane, were allowed into them. Um, but, they could, but they had to speak Greek. They had to be able to speak Greek. And that was the only thing. Um, the, the, the Ellicinian mysteries must, by a back of the envelope calculation, rather similar to the one that said that I've, done, I've heard 777 talks, have initiated at least a million people, but I suspect it's probably far more than that. And at the first stage of the Ellicinian mysteries, you were told a secret. Nobody knows what it was. The Mafia the Yakuza, the Masons, you name the most secretive modern organisation you can think of, somebody has spilled the beans. Nobody revealed the, secrets of, the secret of Eleusis. But it had grains. I looked at this and I thought, this is really interesting. Particularly when I started... Uh, uh, getting over my slight bias against the Greeks, thought, well, let's have a look at their mythology. And I found that, as well as the rites of Eleusis, there were plenty of other ones. I knew about the, the Greco-Roman ones, including um, uh, the ones that we know that were practiced here, like the rites of Serapis and the rites of Mithras, which were, uh, the rites of Mithras were sort of like death down that way, uh, about a 20-minute walk. But, I found something rather odd. The Orphic Rites. Now, the Orphic Rites are, are, are dedicated to the god Orpheus, whose name may, may or may not come, but it's only suggestion I've seen, from a side of the outsider. Um, there were the development of the Dionysian Rites, according to various people. And there's various descriptions of, uh, of them, but the interesting thing is that they've actually left two descriptions of the creation of Dionysus. The creation of the world doesn't agree with the one that most people say is the Greek, the, the, the standard Greek creation myth. It's not totally different. It differs in some details, but it concentrates on Dionysus. Now, the rites of Dionysus seem to be very much associated with wine. And the mythology seems to have something to do with the creation of wine. Every little stage, everything associated, not just the grape, but everything has given a symbolic value. We don't know what they were, but we do know that we've got two different myths about how Dionysus was reborn through Zeus. In one of them, his heart was salvaged and placed into Zeus's thigh from which he was later reborn. In another one, he was burnt, 
Zeus swallowed his ashes and he then impregnated a woman, a human woman, and she gave birth to the reborn Dionysus. Uh, something clicked and I went, these aren't variants. That's the seven-year-olds. That's the 14-year-olds. It's the same story, but for different stages in initiation. And I suddenly saw through the whole of Greek mythology, millions went through the rites of Eleusis, but it wasn't just the rites of Eleusis, the rites of Samothrace. If you wanted to go through the rites of Eleusis, once you went through the first stage, you had to wait a year for the next stage. The rites of Samothrace, which I say is very near to, to Bulgaria, but it's an island that's fairly close to Troy, funnily enough. Anybody, you didn't have to be able to speak Greek to go there. You could go through the first and second degree in two days. You go there on the, so let's suppose it was now, and uh, this is something you could do at the weekend. You could do your first level on the Saturday, then you had to do various things during the night, and on the second day, you took the second degree. By all accounts, hardly anybody did the second degree after taking the first degree. But we don't know what happened to them in between. Something was happening. These mysteries, these secrets that they would never release, we don't know what any of these are. There's a few Christian fathers who came up with uh, their own version. But none of them explain anything. Um, one, one, of the, one of the Christian theologians said that you were shown, I can't remember which mystery it is, you were shown an ear of corn reaped in silence. But he didn't explain what that meant at all. But he didn't know. He didn't know what it meant because he'd never been through the process. The more I looked at this, the more I came to realise that there's a process of understanding that comes to initiates, and this is checked. At the end of the Orphic Mysteries, at the end of the Samothracian Mysteries, at the end of the uh, Eleusinian Mysteries, the highest grade that you could get before, or whether or not, which is also a wouldn't like compulsory, who wanted to join the priesthood was contemplator. You started out as a mystic, <coughs> one of the mystai. If you went through, if you did it in several years, in the case of the Eleusinian mysteries, if you did it in 24 hours, in the case of the Samothracian mysteries, you became a contemplator. And I thought, that's really weird. I know that we're using an English translation of Greek, and I'm very used to an English translation of Indian stuff, but contemplation is one of the highest phases in Raja Yoga, at least when they try to translate yogic terms into English. This made me realize it isn't just the myths. It's not just the Greek myths. We know of many, many Greek thinkers who were initiates. We don't know how many. We only know this person was an initiate of this mystery. Plato was an initiate. Pythagoras was supposed to be an initiate of Egyptian mysteries. Uh, but Egyptian gods found their way very early into Greek <coughs> mystery cults. Isis, particularly. Uh, Serapis, much later, which was a form of Osiris and Apis. But it's only the ones who put their hands up and said, I'm an initiate of so-and-so that we know. We don't know that the others weren't. None of these philosophers actually said, I, I, I didn't go through this. I didn't go through that. The result is we don't know what language they're talking. When they are talking to each other, arguing with each other in their various schools, they are using, I suspect, a language of fellow initiates. 
the terminology they understand. It's shared. Well, we're reading it as logic. We're reading it as as a example. When we read Plato, when we read Aristotle, when we read any of these people, we are reading the work of initiates, talking to each other. So we don't understand the mythology because we've only been given the children's version or something close to it. Go back now. To the beginning of life on Earth. There's two different versions of how this happened. One is Darwin's and one is Nutcase's. I'm sure you know. Um, life either evolved or was created. The big argument. There's a huge argument that um, the fundamentalists use about the fossil record. They want to know why the fossil record never shows intermediate forms. Now, this is actually true, but it's a trick. If you've got a form 100 million years ago and a form 80 million years ago, and you find one that's 90 million years ago that shows some of the aspects of the 10, 10 million years ago gone. But it hasn't, it's starting to develop the ones 8 million years ago. It's given a new species name because it isn't the 8 million year old one and it isn't the 10 million year old one. Therefore, it's given a new species name. And they're saying, well, where's the intermediate one there? Where's one in between the 10 million and the 9 million? And this just goes on and on and on. And they're absolutely convinced that this is the killer argument. It's bollocks, of course. But a more important point, I think, is that the fossil record wasn't laid down for us. The fossil record is a series of accidents. To be fossilised, you have to die more or less in mud or something similar. And, so that, and then dry in such a way that gradually um, your body tissues are replaced the replaceable body tissues, bones and all that are replaced by stone. It wasn't done for us. The Christians, of course, have got a book, a record, from Genesis all the way through to Revelations. That was written for us, they think. It wasn't. Right up until the end, it was really only men. Well, for the, first half, the first part was, was for the Jews, and the second part was for people who thought that Christ was coming back sometime around 100 AD. But nevertheless, it was written for people. The fossil record wasn't written for people. The Bible was written for people, but it wasn't written, written for us. The Greek material, initiate to initiate, taken into account. I don't, when I give this talk, I don't tell you what school I went to. You, I don't ask you, did you go to school? Did anybody here go to school? We all know everyone went to school. These people talking to each other in various different ways and putting on various different productions, whether it's plays, whether it's you know, poetry, whatever, they have a language which you can't necessarily get to unless we've been through a similar situation ourselves. I'm going to talk about the Greeks there. The Romans went in for it. Uh, we don't know from those people who didn't mention whether they were initiates, whether they were initiates or not, but we do know that, uh, for little example, Julius Caesar's father-in-law um, went through the Eleusinian mysteries, and the, 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 the first major pagan martyr Emperor Julian the Martyr, who the Christians call the apostate, went through three different initiatory systems, probably because he was trying desperately to bring the pagan groups together to resist the rise of Christianity. But these initiatory systems exist elsewhere, and we've heard tons about them in the various different talks. But we still have this idea that we're going to be told the truth. We don't have to go through the initiations ourselves. Well, I kind of agree and kind of disagree. If it's one thing I learned through all of the 700 plus 
some sort of some class talks. Is that if you've been through initiation, whether it's in a group or whether it's a personal thing or whatever, you end up in a situation where you hear, for example, a mythology that you've never heard of before and you get it. Or at least you get some of it. But if you're missing the people, as we are, we're missing the people who took people up upper level and upper level and upper level and upper level and upper level, then we're going to miss a lot. We have to take it, I believe, an approach from existing systems. I don't know of many that are better than those in India, uh, Japan and Australia and uh, the Central Americas. But of course one of the problems with those is that an awful lot of them, like the Greek um, traditions, involve the use of hallucinogenic drugs. And this of course is bad. We all know that hallucinogenic drugs are bad um, because they make people uh, see weird things and think weird things and above all um, make them tend to completely dis completely reassess every single thing that they've ever told. And people reassessing what they're told is a bad idea for the for society. I saw today that uh, Barack Obama has made a statement, and this is a statement that only somebody entering his second term of presidency could make and get away with, that the security of the United States does not depend upon us being in a permanent state of war. He won't last. <laughs> that won't last. America has been in a permanent state of war without declaring war on anybody for the past 60 years. America didn't declare war in the Korean War, the, the Vietnam War. Um, it just doesn't do it, because to do that you have to get it through Congress. Um, the President isn't allowed to declare war without the Congress and Senate agreeing, so they never bothered. They've just called it something else. We are told, what it, we are told that this needs to happen. We have to have these security systems in place. We have to give up individual freedoms and all the rest of it. People questioning that is a bad idea. The talks that we've had on various different mystical systems and various different mythologies have convinced me that we just don't know. It applies to every attempt to recreate a paganism from the past. It's not necessarily a bad thing. As long as we take on board something which was discussed here two weeks ago. Now, two weeks ago, the talk was about the Norse myths. Oh, well, it wasn't the talk wasn't about the Norse myths, it was about the runes. I seem to have turned on the runic hoover. I do not know why this has happened, but it has happened. And the, uh, the question came up about texts. Now, text is very important to the Northern tradition because they've got a lot, which we haven't. Uh, we have no Anglo-Saxon mythology. The only story that we've got is about Beowulf and that happened on the continent. And we've got a couple of poems about the runes. When it comes to discussing the various different gods and what they did and what they meant and all the rest of it, there is a t one tendency which says, we can't go back to things which were written by Christians and rely on that. And there's another tendency that says, if it isn't in the texts, if it isn't in the sagas, we won't accept it. But supposing they were written for children? I think they were. I do not believe that just because it's cold up north, their priesthood was made up of people who were asked, do you want to be a priest? Yeah, okay. There had to be training, and the training had to involve understanding. And my God, we know they knew about one of the most potent hallucinogens in Indo-European history, the fly of garlic mushroom, because the berserkers used it. It was used in India, where it was called Soma. It was used in Iran, where it was called Homa. It was probably used in Greek initiation rites too. The initiated understanding though, is something which grows from actually practicing various mental disciplines. And India and Japan are particularly good at this, and I think the main reason is 
that they never really got interrupted. Yes, the, you know, the, the, the Muslims invaded India and the British invaded India, but they didn't really stop the flow of development of Hinduism. The Japanese, perhaps because they're an island race themselves, were remarkable like the Greeks and just absorb everything. And it comes. The Japanese love initiatory questions. I'm trying to imagine that I'm a Greek and it's 2,500 years ago and I am told something or given something after being sworn to secrecy when being in a particular part of the temple of Samothrace where only initiates are a and I've got a day to work it out. Even if I was shown an ear of corn or there's other suggestions that there were phallic images um, that, that you know, this is the great secret. I had 24 hours to think about it. A lot would happen in those 24 hours. The Japanese are brilliant. The Japanese are like the koan, where what you contemplate is a phrase. Unfortunately, it all started going pear-shaped in the uh, after the Second World War, where unfortunately. Unlike the Ab Australian Aboriginals, the Japanese were rather overawed by the Americans and started telling them what the koans were for and what basically giving away the secrets. The secrets of the koans were written down, but these, these writings weren't made available to initiates. So you went to a Zen school and you were told to contemplate a phrase. Um, it would normally be a riddle or a question. Riddles are also used in Sufism a great deal, which also has this whole system of people going up various different grades. The Zen Buddhists would say to somebody, what is the sound of one hand clapping? If a tree falls in the forest and there's no one to hear it, does it make a sound? Does a dog have the Buddha nature? And for thousands of, well, hundreds of years, people sat and contemplated this. And the idea was clearly to make a break in conventional thinking. This was called a satori, a glimpse of enlightenment. And the idea was that if you could get people to get out enough of their conventional thinking, then they would get to the highest level, the level like the contemplator. Unfortunately, they made the text available to the Americans, and the Americans published them all. And before long, there were a bunch of beatniks who, uh, having just stubbed out their joint, would go into a Zen temple and say, OK, what do you want to ask me? Said, Sit and think about this. Does a dog have the Buddha nature? Woo! Oh, you know that one. OK. Um, what is the sound of one hand clapping? Oh, damn, you know that one as well. And basically, all of the answers have been given away. <laughs> so, as a result, the, uh, the most Zen uh, organisations that I know of simply ask the question, who are you? Now, that's a very, very, very big question. And who you think you are, what you think you are, changes according to whatever system you go through. There are some limits on that. I have learned over the uh, 777 plus talks that I've heard, a couple of things, um, and not all of them from the talks, but one is that if somebody comes to completely realize that everything they've been taught up until that point was wrong, that's a very advanced stage. They can make right arseholes of themselves. I remember one speaker who had retired. He had lived a totally conventional life, and one day he saw a clock circle. And that changed his life. Everything had changed. And the next thing, he was walking through talking stick with a pair of dowsing rods, trying to tell us how important this was. Well, yeah, yeah, we've been there. 
dowsing, very, very interesting, and all the rest of it. But to him, it was a major revelation. Came from crop circles. God knows what he thinks now that we know that they're all fake. Um, other cases, if you get actors and actresses who are really good at the method school, where you put your entire personality to one side, so that when you're at work, your character is there. And when you're not at work, you're in California. You will eventually lose any sense of self whatsoever. And the first person who teaches you a technique whereby you change your normal breathing pattern, put you in a particular posture and either chant something mentally or do it out loud, you will have discovered the answer to life, the universe and everything. I do not blame any of it. I do not blame Tom Cruise for becoming a member of an organisation which we all know is perfectly reasonable. Just remember, this is going out of the way here, isn't it? I do not blame Tom Cruise for having got it all correct. <laughs> I don't blame this cut price form of Kabbalah that Cher and Madonna have got. I don't blame them for getting into that. I can understand how they get completely and utterly lost. And I just find it very, very sad that the real Kabbalah and um, other techniques for, for discovering who you are or aren't aren't more available, but they all can kind of work. But when we start judging other cultures and other civilizations, I think that we really have to remember more than anything else, these myths, these texts, whether they're three and a half thousand year old texts or older from Assyria, Babylonia, whether it's texts on logic or that came out of Rome, whether it's the mythology of Australian Aboriginals or whether it's the mythology of, of, of the Norwegians or Amerindians, or whatever. whoever collected them and whoever presented them, and no matter how academic and how academically qualified the people who present them to us are, they were not meant for us. I don't mean that we shouldn't have read them, I don't mean it was wrong, but we have to remember we were not the intended audience. And we have to realise that we do not a we do not normally know who the intended audience was because we don't know at what level it was aimed. We don't know very much about the rit the Mithraic rituals except that they were in seven stages. We know the names of the stages. We know an awful lot about Raja Yoga, which has eight stages, although to tell the truth, the eighth stage is like, that's it, Buddha, Moksha, gone, you've made it all. So I mean, technically there's seven. I quite like the number seven. I quite like the idea that because we live our daily lives in a seven day week, that if we go back to the Greco-Egyptian mysteries and we look at them, and we look at their seven different stages of initiation in various different systems, that we might be able to make something out of it for ourselves. But I cannot go and look at what is said by academics about, including how little they say, and say, that will do. It would be wonderful to think that academics actually do what they say they do. It would be wonderful to think that when they say, well, we're only using the text, we're historians, we are only presenting you with the texts and what they must mean. They don't. The opinion of 19th century white middle class professors, the opinions, even to this day in Wikipedia, are given a great deal of even though they're just somebody's opinion. Look up the Greek myths, look up the, the, the Orphic. The, obviously, the Orphism, the last stage of the Dionysian mysteries, was sort of corrupt. There's a quote from somebody from the, top, the period, not, you know, from the Greek period, saying the Orphics were basically people, these scruffy people, who had absolutely no money whatsoever, who wandered around in rags, offering to initiate rich people for money. Now, 
That could be a completely unbiased point of view. It could be somebody who's trying to sell a different form of mystery, of course. But the, pipe of, the, the, the whole idea behind uh, the late Orphic mysteries was very much one of becoming um, detached, from, very much like a sannyas in, in India or a, a Buddhist monk in the whole swathe of the Buddhist tradition. They weren't supposed to be really interesting. And I'm quite sure that nevertheless they needed to eat, even if it didn't need to eat a lot. And I think that we have the right to say that there is something, and this is going to be the title of the talk when I give it again, when I'm going to do it from a different point of view. I've offered it to the PF London conference, but I haven't heard back yet. The initiated understanding. When we've been through systems of mysticism, when we've been through prolonged periods of meditation, when we've had these little sudden moments of realisation, or we've had very slow build-up, the way that this story about the Australian Aboriginals and, and the white explorers has gradually grown on me to the point where I think it is probably the most important thing of all. We have the right to say to the academics, thank you. This is what we think. And we think you should listen. Because we've had so many talks by academics. I mean, if you want talks by academics, there's a bookshop uh, not that far away from the University of Dublin which does nothing but talks by academics, all based on the available text and all the rest of it. It's all very well. You tell us. I've heard so many interesting talks, many of which are on this list that David Barrett <laughs> provided. And if I turn around to you and say, you know what I reckon this is for? And they say, yes, but that's just speculation. So, yeah. But you're not a mystic. I love the word mystic. I'm becoming more and more in love with the word mystic now than the magician or occultist or anything like that. If you've never sat and contemplated something for an hour and you're not supposed to think about it, you're just supposed to focus on it, as in Raja Yoga, the different stages of, of uh, concentration, meditation, contemplation, and all the rest of it. Um, if you haven't done that, You've got no chance of understanding what these people are actually talking about. Because they did. They were not just academics. The ancient Greeks, millions of them, went through these initiations and never said what happened. Never said what happened. And that's supposed to be fundamental to the whole of Western civilization. The ancient Greeks were absolutely marvellous. The Romans were marvellous. They just first question, is it okay that we can come along to the mysteries too? And there were all these mysteries that we're not going to know about because when Christianity spread, the, pre the pagan priests were murdered. They weren't even given the opportunity to convert. There is no conversion of a, of a, 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 a Viking or an Anglo-Saxon pagan priest on record whatsoever. What we do have is that the, the kings were converted by the missionaries and the first thing that they did to prove their their, their faithfulness to the new religion was to wipe out the priesthood. But we don't know how many grades, how many different stages, what their training was about. But we can kind of work it out because we've done something kind of like that ourselves. We haven't just read texts. And that, I think, is more important than anything else that I learned from all of these talks. We want the academics to talk to us. They're not going to, but it will be nice if they listen to us. And when we turn around and say, we've got an insight on this that you haven't, they can complain all they, they like. We, not, we, we might be wrong, but they can never be right at that level because they won't go into that depth. And that is the end of my talk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.